<coughs> who are with us. So God, thank you again for this privilege that you have brought us together. And even as we close the year uh, with the current crisis uh, that is even before us, once again, Lord, we come before you in humility, in seeking counsel, in seeking your mind, your will, because my God, what you say to us far exceed just for us or for our time or even in our crisis. For no word that you bear to us is more than just a moment because your word is eternal. So my Lord, we thank you. So come as you look upon us in mercy in all of our shortcomings and frailties and so much in us that is not my God at par with you. Come, grant to us that spirit that bring us to you in totality, in wholeness, in fullness, in completeness, in reconciliation. For this we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, saints. Good to see all of you. And, uh, and of course, Joshua and Brendan and I have a friend who has come and joined us. And good to see all of you uh, in Singapore. All you dear ones and Stephen and family, and of course, Ivan and Joanne. All right. Well, uh, year ends, uh, as Eugene was saying. Uh, and it's so much that we can reflect upon. Uh, I have been. Uh, and there's so much that uh, to look forward for all the days that is before us. But at the same time, uh, those things in which you cherish, those things that you miss. I sincerely miss the conference that we were due to have two years ago. Uh, I miss uh, so much of the gathering of the saints, the impartations of spiritual things that the Lord would grant to us uh, collectively, corporately. I miss all of that. Uh, and there's a word that the Lord bear to us individually, but there's also a word that the Lord bear to us corporately. And uh, we are in need of both, without which uh, we don't have two wings uh, to, to, f to fly healthily and to fly properly. And so we need that. I miss that. We miss uh, uh, those things coming from different parts of the world. Uh, and of course, I miss having to be with the church in different parts of the world too. And so here we are uh, that as the year closes. And uh, I wish that we can close together. We can do a conference together at the year end. And oh, none of this is possible with the situation that we're in. Well, here we are. So I'm thankful this morning that uh, I'm not the preacher. Adro is going to be the preacher, and hopefully soon uh, Eugene will take the pulpit too. So I'm having a break. So I'm at the back, having a private devotion with my grandchildren. <laughs> All right, and so praise God. And so Adro is going to come and minister to us. All right. Morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you once again, and uh, good to see Joshua, Brendan, and Joel as well. So I remember uh, when I was contacting uh, Joshua, he said that he would bring a friend, and, and I remember him mentioning the friend's name was Joel, so I was expecting a guy, actually. Then I looked at the message again, and there's an extra E at the end, so that makes all the difference. Uh, so welcome, Joel. It's good to have you amongst us. I'm always excited to see young people uh, with us. So I've been sharing with Joshua uh, quite regularly about this church, you know, about, um, about my, my desire and my, my passion to reach to young people, uh, to speak to them and to engage them uh, in the matters of the faith. So I'm so glad that Joshua is with us and Brendan as well. And even Silas at some point, uh, I hope to, to see him again soon and to catch up with him as well. So anyway, uh, so like Eugene was saying also, uh, it's been an interesting and tough week for all of us. 
So uh, what happened was I kind of fell ill in the beginning of the week, uh, had a bit of a flu. It's not, not COVID, so don't worry about it. Uh, but yeah, I was just feeling quite, quite just exhausted and tired for a few days. And then lo and behold, Jaina also fell ill, I think on Thursday. So uh, my family and I, as in my dad, myself, and, and my mom had to kind of step in and help Eugene and Eunice to babysit her for a while. And then that chin fell, fell ill on Friday with a kind of a short bout of food poisoning. So it's been a very hard week for us uh, in, in that sense. But thankfully, we're all, all right now. By the grace of God, we've been, been sustained, we've been kept. And uh, I have now this privilege to share this word, uh, to share the word with you in this morning, something that I've looked forward to. Uh, this whole week, uh, in spite of all the difficulties. So even in preparation yesterday, as I was preparing for the word, uh, half my time was spent keeping Jaina out of my room <laughs> because of the babysitting duties that we had to do as well. But uh, it's a joy to be again uh, with you all here. And uh, even with Stephen, Peggy, Ivan, Bilian, and jo Joanne, it's good to see all of you as well. So... Um, before I begin, I would like to kind of uh, just reiterate what has already been said by both Eugene and, and Chin that, uh, yeah, I think as we close this year, it is definitely a time of reflection, a time of introspection even to see, yeah, what is the Lord saying to us both individually and even collectively? I think the Lord is, is, is wonderful in that he sees us both as individuals and also as part of a body. So he talks to us, he speaks to us in the times that we are in, in the moments of our lives that we are in, in the details of our lives, our careers, our families, our friends. Uh, he speaks to us that he knows the, uh, the minute details of our being. He knows what we are going through. He knows what we're facing. He knows our struggles. Even the things that we don't share with people, he knows. You know? So he is saying something to all of us individually. At the same time, he's also speaking to his church. He's also looking at us as part of his people. He's looking at us as part of the body. So you're not just you. You are also part of a larger body. So what is he saying to the church? What is he saying not just to you, but also to what the larger body entails? And I think that this whole pandemic has really brought that into focus personally and even collectively. We are made to see what are our priorities. We are made to see what's important to us, what's not. Uh, so it was very poignant when I was having this discussion with my boss, you know, about church. And he was just saying that, he, you know, uh, he, his own pastor is wondering whether even 20% of his church members will come back because they're starting to realize that church is not a priority. You know, uh, this gathering is not that important anymore. Uh, I can just as easily do this at home. You know, I can stay in my pajamas. Uh, I can just wake up five minutes before the meeting and I'm ready. I'm all set. So why, why go through all the hassle? So that's just one thing. That's just one issue that, that we are battling with now, you know, that the whole issue of the centrality of the word, the centrality of the gospel, the centrality of the church in the lives of men and women today is, is now being shaken. And again, it's not like there's this, there's this great crisis where Christians are being persecuted, you know, that we are being tested so severely. We're not. It's, it's a virus, you know, and it's a terrible virus. It's, it's, it's something that has ravaged countries all over the world but it is not threaten our faith. You know, we're not being persecuted uh, like we will probably in the last days. We're not being hunted down. And yet look at, look at how lackadaisical we are. Look at how lazy we are. Look at how easy it is for us to slip in to, to, that, to, that, to that whole, you know, procrastination. Uh, that's the word uh, in the faith that we've become. And I'm not just talking about Malaysia. It's all over the world. You know, whoever I talk to from across the borders or across the country's borders, they're all facing the same thing. You know, this lethargy, this, this, this lackadaisical uh, approach to the faith and to, to the word and to the church. It's become, that itself is a pandemic, you know. And again, it's not as though the pandemic brought this on. I think that the pandemic, if anything, has shown us who we truly are individually and even collectively. It, is revealed, it has revealed to us the state of so many churches, the state of so many people in their lives, what they have been doing, what they have been investing in, you know, what have they been putting stock in uh, in these times and days. So th this has also been a part of my uh, meditation, my contemplation for the past few weeks. Uh, we've been deliberating on this whole theme of the new creation, 
you know, what it entails, what it means to us. What does it mean to be a new creation? What does it mean to be created in the image of Christ, in the image of God? What does it mean for our lives? What does it mean for our being? What does it mean for our actions, our words, our thoughts, our desires, our motives in the, in the times that we are in? So it's a cause for reflection, uh, even as we end this year and as we begin the new one. So let us continue to do so, um, so as to not miss what God is saying to us individually and even collectively. So Lord, we thank you for this time and this day that we, are, that we have once again. Thank you for the Sabbath morning, for the people that you have brought together, not just here, but even in Singapore and in all across the nations of this world. But we pray that a sense of your word will be given once again, that a revelation of who you are, Lord, will be communicated through this pulpit and through many other pulpits throughout the land. But we know, Lord, that if you don't speak, then all manner of speaking is in vain. That if you don't give yourself to us, whatever we give as preachers, whatever we give as men, will not suffice uh, to the body of Christ. So come, Father, we are in desperate need of your word. We're in desperate need of you to give us something of your heart, of your very being. For without it, Lord Jesus, all words we say are in vain. So come, Father, because, Lord, if you don't speak, then there is no hope. If you don't speak, there is no light and there is no life. So come, Lord, and speak to your people here in Malaysia and in Singapore and in Brunei, in Thailand, in Japan, in Sweden, in Mongolia, in Sri Lanka, in India, in Africa, in America. Lord, speak your words. Even as we close this year, let us be mindful of what you are saying. Let there be those sensitive few, those remnant church, Lord, that will be close to your heart then and will know and will desire, Father, what is it that you are truly saying? That amidst the pandemic, amidst everything that's going on, that we will get into the heart of God and we will be able, Father, to see and to hear and to know and to sense what you are saying and what is it that you want from us in the midst of all of this. So we thank you for the grace that has been extended to us, for the time that you have given us to prepare ourselves, to make ready your church, to be prepared for what is to come. So we thank you. We ask you to come and be amongst us, not just here in the giving of this word, but even the listening of it. Lord, prepare our hearts and prepare us even, even after we leave this place. Let not your presence depart from us. Let not what you say return into you void. Let it not be in vain. So we thank you once again for the Sabbath morning. We thank you for each and every life here, young and old, for the grace that you have dispensed, for the love that you have given to us. We are, totally, we are truly and eternally grateful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I would like to turn your uh, Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. So I'm going to open to that with you all. So this will be the primary or main text that I will be focusing on with you today. So now, um, before I get into the text, I would just like to give you all some context uh, to the study of the word. Now, all of you who are followers of Christ, you are also, by extension, uh, students of the word. So part of, the, part of being students of the word is to also know what the Bible is saying and what context the Bible is set in. So one of the very important things when you're reading scripture is to also know what is the author trying to say, okay? What is the author saying in the time and place that he is in? All right. Now, I'm not saying you have to do a deep dive into the, into the word uh, like a theologian, but what is good to keep yourself or to keep yourself safe from misinterpreting or from having your own interpretation is to look at the origin or the author's original intent. And, and by intent, I mean, what was his purpose? What was he trying to do? What was he trying to say? Who was his audience? Right. Um, what was he trying to counter? What was he trying to bring out? What was he trying to pinpoint? Uh, was, it a, 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 was it a word of correction? Was it a word of admonition? Was it a word of encouragement, right? Now, the book of Hebrews is a very interesting one because we don't know much in terms of origin. Who is the author, for example, is, is still a mystery to us. And uh, biblical scholars have um, put out many, many names. Some have said it's probably Paul. Some have said it's Apollos. Some have said it's Barnabas. Some have said it's Silas. Uh, some have even said that it's probably someone outside the, the inner circle of the disciples. Now, whatever it is, whoever it is, uh, that is actually not the main point. But we do know it is, definitely a, it is definitely scripture that is inspired divinely by the Holy Spirit. So we know the author. The author is the Holy Spirit. Now, what is also very certain is that this author, whoever it is, uh, is very Pauline in his understanding of scripture. Now, not, that's not to say it is Paul. Uh, it could be. 
but a lot of scholars actually agree that it's probably not because the style, the, the way it is written is just very, it's very uh, dissimilar. Okay. And the context here is that the, the, uh, even though we don't know who the, the author is, we do know what the author, what author's intent was. So it's twofold. Okay. The author's intent in the book of Hebrews, if you've read it before, you will know that it is a book of encouraging the saints. All right. And by the, by, by the word saint, I mean those who, have been, who are being persecuted in, uh, in this time and age that the Hebrew writer is writing in. All right. So there was heavy persecution going on. Now, there, was not, there were no martyrdom at this point in the book of Hebrews. The people had not yet died for their faith, but they were being persecuted. These were new Christians, all right? Christianity is very new to the scene, and there were many persecutions being made by people within the Jewish circle. So meaning that these were Jewish believers, Christians, who were being persecuted by their Jewish uh, brethren, all right? The people of the, the Judaistic faith. So that's one. So that was, the, that was the, the, one of the reasons why the Hebrew writer wrote this. It was a way of, of encouraging them. Now, the, other, um, the second reason was also to confront many of the Jewish believers who have been saved, but have not given their lives fully to Christ. There was some reservation some of these believers were having. Like, how, what does this mean for our Hebraic faith? What does this mean about with the Old Testament? So what, how does this connect? What had, when you say that Jesus has come, he has come to die for us on the cross, he has come to give us salvation, he has come to establish Calvary, and that's all well and good, but how does this relate? How does this connect to my Judaistic paths? How does this uh, connect to what we have gone through as a nation for thousands and thousands of years? So there were some who were finding it very hard to reconcile between Christianity and Judaism. So if you realize the book of Hebrews is very heavy about going back into history, talking about the high priest, talking about the sacrifices, talking about Old Testament practices. So the Hebrew writer is very clear by what we read and by what we can investigate. He's very, very keen on trying to reconcile what it means for these believers and their Jewish past and their Jewish history. Okay? So now what i like to do, uh, just to put it on the board here, so... The context is very important, as I said, and, and part of what I will be referring to as I go along is to also talk about the audience that he is talking to. So the book of Hebrews, according to scholars, were written for three types of people, all right, or rather the target audience, if you will, was threefold, okay? One was, we've already covered this, so I mentioned this earlier, was the, he was writing it to the persecuted Christians, okay? And again, just to be precise, persecuted by the Jewish brethren, okay? Now, number two, let me just refer to my notes here really quick. Don't want to, okay, wrong. So the second um, type of, uh, the second group of believers, okay? that the Hebrew writer was writing to were actually similar Jewish believers but only in intellect, okay? Now, what I mean by this was um, there were a group of believers within uh, this time period that were very fascinated with um, the faith, okay? They considered themselves, yeah, I believe. I believe what you said. I believe about, I, I believe, you know, what you, what you mentioned and what you preached and what you shared about Christ, you know? I believe about the cross and his death and resurrection. But the Hebrew writer knew that a lot of these people did not commit in their faith. They were believers only in mind, but not in their hearts. They were believers in terms of their superior intellect. All right? They were Jewish people. These were intelligent men and women. These were men and women of the Torah. These were people that were, that were filled with scripture to the brim. You know? And so they thought that if I can live or if I can um, practice my faith the same way I practice my Judaistic faith, I'll be fine. So the Hebrew writer was condemning that. He was saying, that's not how you live this life. That's why the Hebrew writer is very, very concerned about this new creation, about what it means to live in this new life. 
but what it means to live in obedience to the word. So he was very, very strict. He was very, very zoned in and very focused on this idea that you're not saved just because you believe up there. You're not saved just because you believe in your mind. Christ demands more. Christ desires more. God wants not just your mind. He wants your heart. He wants the total being of who you are to be surrendered to you. So that's number two. Number three, okay, and this is the last one. Number three were Jewish non-believers, okay, who were also who were also fascinated with the figure of Christ. Okay. So these were the three uh, groups of people that, that the Hebrew writer was writing to. Okay. I'm not going to refer to it again and um, uh, um, repeatedly, but I'm putting up in the board because I think the context is important, that as we read through the scripture and as we go through it together, uh, it's very important to keep this in mind. It's very important to understand that this is who uh, the Hebrew writer had in mind when he's writing or when he's saying the things that he's saying. And it draws parallel to us, to who we are as modern believers today, all right? So the struggles that we have, I think, is very similar to what the Hebrew writers was referring to even back then, uh, especially, or rather, more poignantly, um, these two, okay? As I said, for the persecuted church, the Hebrew writer is very encouraging. He's very positive, and he's very sympathetic to their plights. But to these two, not so much, all right? He, he becomes... Uh, he becomes very admonishing. He becomes very, in some sense, even condemning about their behavior, about their state of being, about how they are. That you're here, you, you think you believe, you think you know, but you don't really. You've not accepted fully into the cross, into the salvation experience that Christ offers. So these are the three believers, but the two that I want to pay attention to are these two. The Jewish believers who are only so in intellect, and the Jewish non-believers who were very fascinated with the figure of Christ, but were not willing to commit. You know, these, the, third, the third group is the one that's very hold on or very, um, what I say, very connected to their old ancient traditions of the Jewish faith, of the Jewish beliefs. All right? And they, 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 they didn't want to make that extra step. They didn't want to have that leap of faith. Um, they wanted to maintain their old ways. All right? And Jesus was fascinating. He was a fascinating figure, but you know, they weren't willing to commit. Okay, you have to remember that at this point, Jesus has, of course, uh, ascended to the Father's right hand. So a lot of what people now know about Christ is from secondhand information. It's from what people say. So there's a lot of fascination at that time about this Christ figure who had come and gone. But the Hebrew writer is trying to say, this, he's not a figure of fascination. He's not a figure for you to, 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 be, to be interested in or, or to try to think about. You know, he is the savior. He is the son of God. He is the son of man. He has come to save. He has come to save us. And he has come to bring us into repentance. That was what the Hebrew writer was trying to communicate. So even as we now read uh, Hebrews 5, okay, bear in mind these, these group of believers that he is talking to, okay? So I'm going to read the whole account, uh, the whole, sorry, the whole chapter here from verse 1 to verse 14. It's not a very long chapter. And I'm reading from the NASB. So whatever version that you have, it's not too far off, I'm sure. Okay, so follow along as we start. So verse one, um, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. Now, as, well, as all of you know, that the Hebrew writers of course referring to Jesus Christ. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes honor to himself, but receive it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. Aaron, as you all know, <clears throat> was the first priest of Israel. Okay, <clears throat> now verse five. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was, and he was hurt because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who particip- partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he, he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So may the Lord bless the reading of his word. So there's a lot packed in this uh, chapter 5 uh, part of the book and um, there's so much I want to get into and I want to go one by one uh, with you about what this actually means. Now for me um, the most famous verse that I, I really like that we here as a church have often talked about is the whole part where Uh, He says that in verse 8, that although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, that's a very fascinating verse when you think about it, that although he were a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. But I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, What I would like to do is actually go back a bit. And I think that when we actually analyze and we actually go through the scripture in the first part of chapter 5, and then we get to it, it actually makes more sense. It becomes more meaningful. Now, again, a bit of context, all right? The office of a priest in the days of uh, Israel of old was an office that was divine in nature, okay? I mean, all offices that God gives is divine in nature, of course. But for the high priests, um, their calling was very special in that they were chosen specifically by God, right? So in this case, in the case of uh, the time of Moses, it was Aaron who was called to be a priest, right? And subsequently, all the other priests were called by God. They were chosen, but they were human, all right? So they were fallible. They were sinful. Um, they, were, they were not perfect at all, okay? So again, remember the, the, the context. So what the Hebrew writer was trying to show to his audience was this, that Jesus Christ is not just another one of those priests. He is a high priest, but he is the great high priest, His order is not according to the order of Aaron. He's human, but he's also not. You see what he's trying to do? See what he's trying to say to the the Hebrew uh, audience? He's trying to say that Jesus is a priest, a great high priest who was in the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you study uh, uh, Old Testament scripture, you will know that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. But he was also interesting because he was not just a king, he was also a high priest. So the Hebrew writer is saying that this Jesus that we worship, this Jesus that we are talking about, his priesthood is not just one that is tied to his office. He is not just a priest. He is more than that. He is also a king. He is also, more importantly, a son. So if you look at verse 5, it's very interesting because he says here, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So what the Hebrew writer writer does here is fascinating because what he's doing is this. He is saying that Jesus, the one whom we worship, the one that you are struggling with right now, he's not just a high priest. He is also a son. So both the passages uh, in verse 5 and in verse 6 comes actually from the Psalms, all right? One is from Psalms 2, verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And the other is in Psalms 110, verse 4. So the Hebrew writer is saying, this priest that you and I are worshipping, he is also a son. See, never before in the history of Israel has the, 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 the office of a priest been tied to the reality of sonship. So the Hebrew writer is doing something that has never been done before. He's doing something new. He's breaking new grounds. He's showing to you this Jesus that we worship. He's not just a a high priest. He's the great high priest. Why? Because he is also the son. The son is who we are worshiping. 
we, we are worshiping the one who has become a son, who is the son of God himself, the one and only begotten son of God, in fact. So what he's saying is that this is who we worship. That's why he's different. That's why he's not the same. He's not alike. He's not like the other priests of old. So part of the priestly duties of uh, the priests in Israel, as you all know, was to offer sacrifice as a propitiation for sin, right? That's why they were animal sacrifices uh, in, in the tabernacle, in the temple. Why? It was to show to Israel that your sins, that all of that, the, the things that you've done, all of the bad things that you have committed, all of the sins that you have committed in past, this is how, this is what it results in, that there has to be a judgment, there has to be a wrath, there has to be a punishment of some kind. And the animals stood in for them. The priest was to be the one that would practice or that will uh, sacrifice the animal for, uh, for a, as a propitiation for their sins. But, think, but if you look at it, if you study Old Testament, you will know that the, 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 the sacrifices bring them to repentance. Did any of the high priests from the tribe of Levi, from Aaron, from all of that line of priests, did any of them save Israel? No, we know that for a fact that they did not. Now, is that because the priest, is that because the office of the priest failed? No, it's not because of the office of the priest, all right? God ordained that office. God ordained the function of priests to be a very important and vital part of the history of Israel. Nothing wrong with it. But what was wrong was the hearts of the people in Israel. What was wrong was the hearts of men, your heart, my heart. So the Hebrew writer is trying to show to you, trying to show to the audience here that the priest couldn't save us. Your history couldn't save you. The priest that, 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 we always, that, we, that, that God appoints for us, these human beings, these fallible men and men, and men, not, not women, sorry, these fallible men that God chose to ordain to be as priests, they've not, they've not, they've not saved you. None of their sacrifices have saved you. You are still in sin. You're still living in that cycle of sin. You're still living with this, with this whole dark past that, you, that, you, that you've not delivered yourself from. You know, the power of sin is still very much in you. The power of disbelief, the power of unbelief is still very much in you. You're not making that stride. You're not making that leap. Why? Because you're still very much stuck in your old ways. So the Hebrew writer is trying to show to you and to us, to me, to you and I, and to uh, through the audience, of course, in the Hebrew writer, that this is who we are, that we're still stuck in our past, we're still stuck in our ways, that there is so much of who we are that is hindering our belief in who Christ is. So what was God's response? What was God's answer to the stubbornness of the Jewish people, to the evil and the sin that was in their hearts? He was to send his only son. That's why I always say that the insertion of Christ into history was special not because of him being a prophet or a priest or a king or a rabbi, although he was all of these things, it was because he was God's only begotten son. That was what marked him out. That was what made him capable of being the savior of this world. His sonship to the father is what made his sacrifice to be the one and once and for all, for all eternity, it was because of his, of his being and of his reality as a son to God. So the Hebrew writer says that the priest that we worship, he is the high priest according to the elder of Melchizedek. Now, if you study, again, scripture, you will know that the, 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 the line of Melchizedek is very strange because there is no record of it. <laughs> There's very little that we know of, all right? All we do know that it is a very special line of king and priest, and Jesus is a part of that. So it kind of tells you that this orig the origin of Jesus' priesthood is divine. It's not men. It's not human made. It is not devised by any uh, engineering of men or any thought of men. This is purely God's realm. This is purely God's domain. And Jesus comes from there. But he is also a son. Now, what does that mean? If he is a son and he is also a priest, what does that mean for you and I? What does that mean that his sonship and his priesthood are intended with one another? Why did the Hebrew writer connect the two? And this is what I believe and, and what I'm reading into it. it is he connected the two is because, like I said, his sacrifice, the sacrifice that he would make, and he, he has made, of course, at this time of the Hebrew letter, was to be a sacrifice for everyone. But what marked his sacrifice out from the others was because he sacrificed himself. 
you all know this, right? That what marked Christ out as a high priest and as a son is because he sacrificed himself. He didn't, he didn't sacrifice an animal. It wasn't the animal that went to the cross. It wasn't a goat or a lamb or a pigeon or a bull. It was himself. And what made his sacrifice viable, what made his sacrifice connected to salvation was because he, he offered up himself. Now, was that journey to the cross easy? Was that journey of, to the cross simple? Was it something that he, uh, he went through like a breeze? Far from it, right? The Hebrew writer knew this. He knew the agony that Christ went through to an extent. He knew the path to the cross was a rocky one, was a, was a tough one, was a trying one. How do I know that? Well, this is where verse 8 comes in, okay? Or rather, verse 7 to verse 8. So let's read it again. So how do we know how difficult it is? In the days of his flesh, he'd offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. So what is the Hebrew writer saying to the audience? He's saying, this is how difficult it was. This was what it was like for Christ, who is the son of God, made flesh, now is in our time. Okay? He's been inserted into history. He is now human like all of us. And this is what he is going through. Okay? Um, and then verse 8, that although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, I want, to, I want to pose a question to all of you. Why did Christ have to learn obedience? That's a good question, right? If you think about it. Christ is already obedient. Think about it. He existed before even time began. He existed before he came to this earth. He existed before he became a physical being. But yet, the scripture is so clear. He learned obedience through the thing or from the things which he suffered. So a good question to ask is, why does he need to learn obedience? It's not as though he was an unruly child. <laughs> it wasn't as though he was an unruly son. It wasn't as though he was a disobedient son from the beginning. He was always a son. For all eternity, he was God's only begotten son, even before the foundations of this world. So why does he need to learn obedience? Here's the key, saints, and this is what is important for us to understand. He learned obedience because he had to for our sakes. He had to learn obedience as the son of men. He had to know for himself what it meant to live this life in a physical human form. Think about it. This has never been done before in the history of the world. Never has a divine being take on the form of humanity, take on the human condition and suffered like we have. And to know what it means to, to be human, to know what it means to have emotions, to know what it means to have physical thoughts, to have human bodily functions, to go through life having to socialize, having to talk to people, having to communicate on this ball of earth that we are in. It's never been done before. So Jesus had to go through that process. There was no shortcut, all right? There was no, there was no, uh, there was no easy way for Christ to do this, he had to suffer. He had to go into it. He had to go through every, every day living the life of a human being. But what, was, what marked him out was that he learned obedience. And he learned that by suffering. And I like to believe he suffered constantly. Think about it. How can a, a divine being, an eternal being, you know, be living separate from the Father for, so long, for, for, for such a long time? For 33 years, he was separate from the Father to, 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 in some extent. I'm not saying he was separate from the Father in every way, but to some extent, he was. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't living with the Father. He was living on this earthly realm. He was living in this physical body, this human condition. But he learned obedience. Why? He learned it for you and for me. He learned it for the church. He learned it for his people. He was learning it to show you and I, this is what salvation will do to you. This is what salvation will mean to you. This is what my life will become for you. If I can live this life, if I can live in obedience to the Father, so can you. In fact, this is what you must do. Your life now becomes a life of obedience. He learned it through suffering. How do you think we will learn it? <laughs> through the same way. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And why? For our sakes. He didn't have to. He didn't need to, right? But he chose this. He chose this because this was the path of salvation. Now, obedience itself in this context, saints, is not about 
oh, you know, when, when oftentimes we think about obedience, we think about it in terms of what? Behaviors, right? We think, we think in terms of actions. We think in terms of, oh, if, if we, you, you, you want a child to obey, it means what? You obey laws, you obey commandments, you obey instructions, right? This is what obedience means. Now, the obedience that he, the Hebrew writer is talking about is not in regards to that. He's not talking about, oh, this is what you must do, okay? Obedience means you follow step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. That's not what, Jesus, what, uh, what the Hebrew writer is referring to. The Hebrew writer is referring to a, to a spirit of obedience. He's referring to the heart of obedience itself. And what does that mean? It means, where, it means that everything in our being, everything in our lives is in obedience to the Father. It means that everything in the makeup of our being, in our disposition, is yielded to obedience to the Father. So we're not just obeying in moments. We're not just obeying in certain situations. You know, that's, that's our understanding of obedience. We want children, like, you know, like Jaina, we want her to obey when she's about to go to sleep. Obey, listen, sleep, sleep time, all right? We want, we want her to obey when she's eating. All right, eating time, obey. You get it? That's how we, depart, we, we compartmentalize the idea of obedience. But the obedience that the Hebrew writer is talking about here is not situational. It's not momentary. It's not according to, to situations. It's talking about the spirit of obedience, that Jesus learned it as a human being, what it meant to obey the Father, what it meant to be in total submission to the Father, means that it, meaning that everything about his life is in nothing about his life, is outside God's will, meaning every action, every word, every thought, every direction he went, every person he met, everything he said to people was in obedience to the Father. Now, what cost him, what, what did it cost Christ to obey the Father? It cost him everything. It cost him even his own life. It cost him never to be understood by people around him. Think about it. If you, are, if, if, if you were Christ, living in a world so foreign to you, is there not suffering? Living in a world where people don't understand you, where people will think that you're weird, you're strange, that you're not, you're not playing along, you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not like us, you know? What must, it, what must it have been like for Christ? It was suffering. To bear that every single day of his life, to know that his life is not like everyone else's. He must have suffered. Now, we think of suffering only when, he, when he's at Gethsemane or when he's at Golgotha, when he actually physically suffers. And that is also suffering, saints. Don't get me wrong. But I like to believe that every day of his life, when he was separate from the Father, in terms of proximity and distance, physically speaking, you know, it was a suffering for him. But he obeyed. That's the thing. He obeyed throughout his entire life. There was not a moment he slipped. Now, you and I, we can obey in patches. We can obey here and there. We can get it right here and there. But overall, you know, we will say, yeah, we have not been obedient in everything. If we're honest, we'll tell you right now, yeah, my obedience is inconsistent. But that was never Christ because Christ was perfect. Christ's obedience was in every single thing. Christ's obedience was, was absolute. It was total. And, what, is, and what, 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 what it means for us, what it means for you and I is this. That obedience he lived out, that obedience that he had, that he learned, he wants you to do the same. He wants it to also be for you. So is obedience absolute in you, in me? Is it complete? Has it convicted us in these areas of our lives? Has it come to confront us in those areas? Has that new creation reality shown us things in us where it's asking us, are you obeying? Are you obeying in these areas of your life? Are you obeying in the areas of your career? Are you obeying in the areas of your relationship with your family? Are you obeying when you're with your personal thoughts, when you're alone, when you're idle, when there's no one watching you? Are you obeying the word of Christ when no one is seeing you? Are you obeying when you're with your colleagues, when, with, when, when you're with someone of the, the opposite gender? Are you obeying when no one is watching you? That's what obedience means in this context. It's not just, it's not just oh, I'm obeying because I hear what you say and I'm following your commands. I follow your orders. That's good and all. That's great. But the obedience that the Bible demands is far greater than any of that. It's one of the things that, one of the things that we, we, we've gone through as a church. And those of you who are with us, like Mei-Ping and Trika, you know what I'm talking about. I remember in the last, in the last reiteration of our church, we, we had a, 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 the, one of the last meetings where we talked about 
disbanding the church. And I remember saying this, that our failure, and I was included in that, I said our failure as a church is not because of how we were in church, it's how we were outside of it, that we failed outside of church. Then think about it. Are we not in our best behavior when we are in church? We are. Are we obedient when we are in church? We are. Anything the pastor says goes, we will listen. Right? If, if you went to visit our church, you know, in the last, the last reiteration, yeah, if you, you visit us on a Sunday, everything was good. Everything was in order. Everything was perfect. People were saying the right thing. They were saying the right things. They were behaving in the right way. But what caused the disbandment? What caused the, the, the unreality and falsehood to creep in? was because I believe that we are disobeyed outside of church. When people were not watching us, when Chin wasn't watching us, when Adra wasn't watching us, when Eugene wasn't watching us, we were, we were failing. We were disobeying, saints. So where is, the, where is the obedience in that? Where is the obedience outside of pure stream? Where is the obedience outside of your church? Where is the obedience when you're with your friends? Where is the obedience when with when your colleagues? Where is the obedience when with your daughters and your sons, when you're with your wife and your husband? Where is the obedience in that? Where is the conviction that you should be feeling that I'm not living my life in the right way? Obedience, has nothing, obedience is not just connected to the moralities and the ethics of do's and don'ts. You and I, none of us here are criminals. None of us here deserve to go to jail because you've done nothing wrong in that extent. Now, does that mean you're obedient? Well, according to society, you are. But according to scripture, it takes more than that. According to scripture, you are to obey in every area of your life. And you want to learn it by the things in which you suffer. Meaning that what, saints? Obedience is not going to come easy. Obedience in those areas of your life is going to hurt. Obedience in those areas means you're going to pay a price. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be conflicted against. You're going to be attacked. You're going to be come against. People will not see it eye to eye with you. Even right now as we speak, this ministry is being attacked by people who don't understand what we have to do. Even now, there are people who, don't, who, who misunderstand, who misconstrue our actions and our deeds because we had to obey. And those of you close to us know what I'm talking about. That's the price you pay. So my question to you and to myself is, have you paid for your obedience? Have you suffered for the things you have to obey? Have you gone through the same the, the things that Christ had to go through when he was here on this earth, that he had to learn obedience to the things in which he suffered? So obedience, guys, everyone, is not just here or there or this part or that part. Obedience is all-encompassing. The obedience is entire, it's absolute, it's, it's, it's in everything. It's in the little things that we think don't matter, but matter a lot. That's why when the life of the new creation comes, is it, is it convicting us in those areas of our being? Is it confronting us in areas that we have been disobedient for a very, very long time? So one of the things I love about you know, uh, new believers, whenever I talk to them or whenever I converse with them, one of the things I like to ask is what, what were some of the things that, that, you know, that God revealed to you that you did not know before? You know, were there certain behaviors or were there certain actions or certain thoughts or certain uh, ideas that you, you, you thought were all right, but then suddenly when you were saved, it became very different. And a lot of them said, yeah, a lot of my cultural understanding of things need to change. I felt wrong. I felt that this whole, I, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole understanding of filial piety wasn't good. That I cannot be keeping, I cannot submit and, and, and count out to my parents in everything, in every way. That there are some times where I have to obey Christ, where I have to obey the word of God over that of my parents. Now, is that, was, that, was, that, was that something that, that, um, uh, that had to be explicitly told to them? No. They knew it in their hearts. They knew it because there was now a spirit of obedience given to them in their hearts, in their lives. That's convicting them of things that they were never convicted before. So that's what the life of God does in us. That's what it means to live and to learn obedience from the things which we have suffered. And that's how we are made perfect, saints. That's how the Hebraic understanding of perfection comes. We are not made perfect by knowing more. We're not made perfect by studying more. We're made perfect by obedience. That the more we obey, the more we yield and surrender these areas of our lives to God, the more he works into us. 
the more he is able to move in our hearts, to change us, to transform us, to conform us even to his image and to his likeness. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. And having, made, having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him. There you go. To all those who obey him, verse 9, the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So again, context. He is telling these Jewish believers, this is your problem. You are not in obedience to the Father. You know him up here. You subscribe to him in thoughts. You, you, you live your life you know, um, correctly, but you have not obeyed him. You have not given your faith to him. You're not given your life to him. You have not made that plunge, as they say. You've not made that leap of faith. And why is that? Because there are, there are areas in your life you are not in obedience to. And that's the thing about this type of obedience. The government can't catch you on this. <laughs> Society cannot pinpoint that this is where you are disobedient and therefore you shall be punished. No, we can't. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were perfect in every way. They were perfect in terms of commandments. They were perfect in terms of their obedience to scripture, to the Torah. And yet, what was the contention of Jesus with these people? That you are like a, like you are a filthy sepulcher that's clean on the outside, filthy on the inside. How can, you, how can you measure obedience in that way? How can you say that this person or that person is not in obedience? Well, you and I can't, but you know who can? The one who learned obedience through suffering. So when he comes to you, saints, he comes with this rod. He comes with this measure. He comes with this reality. He comes to confront and he demands obedience from you. Why? Because he demanded it of himself. He can only make the demand on you because he himself was demanded from. He can, only, he can, he can tell you obedience will cause you to suffer because he himself suffered. So do you see now why he needed to learn that as son of man? Why he needed to learn that in the human condition? Because he's not a savior who is disconnected from the human condition. He's not a savior who doesn't know our weaknesses, who doesn't know our downfalls, who doesn't know our pitfalls, who doesn't know what it means to be human. He knows. In fact, he knows more than you do. And he comes to you and says, this is what I demand. This is what I want. This is the obedience I require. And is it difficult? Is it agonizing? Is it hard? Is it costly? Yes. But don't think that this is you. Don't think that this is not fair. Because it is unfair. <laughs> but Christ himself went through it. Christ himself paid that price for you, for your eternity, for your salvation. So how are we to respond? How are we to act? How are we to, 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 give, to give to God that which is due, but, just, but, 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 but to surrender, to submit? How can we fight him? How can we turn away from him we have we are israel turned away from him israel turned away from god so we have believers today who are in such states we are so many of us are in such states and how are we to live our lives how are we to 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 come to such a place if not by surrender if not by submission now another aspect of obedience that that i've heard before, and I'm sure that you all have to, is we, we have this sense of false bravado, if you will, that obedience is about psyching yourself up. It's about having, it, having enough of sheer will so that when that time comes, we will be prepared. You ever heard of that before? That it's about, you know, just get yourself ready. Be prepared. You know, you've heard this, this whole narrative and this whole rhetoric, right? The end times is coming. Be prepared, right? The last days are on the horizon. Be prepared. Be equipped. You've heard of that? <laughs> I remember in my, in my days of uh, in, in homeschooling, in the homeschooling center I used to go to when I was young, we had this uh, very pseudo spiritual teacher. All right, I won't say his name, but I remember he was just, he was, uh, to put it very nicely, he was a nut. Okay. And he would always, for some reason, he had a fascination about end times. He always had this very weird um, take on, you know, what is the end times going to be like? And he would, he would, Every, every chapel's time, every chapel service, he would come and he would talk about, you know, we have to be ready for the end times. And the way he talked about it, you know, was, was, very, was very psyched up. You know, it was as though he was saying that in order to be ready, we need to be motivated. We need to be properly motivated so that when people come into your house, when people break into your house and want to persecute you and want to, 
take you, you'll be able to say, go ahead, take me. You know what I mean? He's like that kind of person. He wanted you to be psyched about what's going to happen. He wanted you to be, to be properly motivated so that when these people break into your house and want to, want to take you away to jail or want to kill you and shoot you on the spot, you be prepared. He thought it was like that. The way he crafted his message, the way he, he shared about the end times, this is what he said. You know, that if my, I, I told my family, he said this, I told my family, you know, if, 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 if there are authorities that march into our house and break down our door and, and they want you to confess that or they want you to, uh, to deny that Jesus is the Christ or we'll shoot your father, just tell them, shoot me. That's how you end. Now, is it, is it admirable? Is it commendable to have such, uh, to have such attitudes, to have, uh, to have uh, such courage, quote-unquote? Yeah, to an extent it is. But that's not how obedience works, saints. You don't get to obey at that point of juncture and the time where it's so pivotal and you say yes if you've not been obeying for all the times preceding. Now, we like to always use the Garden of Gethsemane as the point of reference when it comes to obedience, right? What did Jesus say to God? Twice, he said this, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass me. If it's possible, let this cup pass me. But nevertheless, what does he say? Not my will, but thine be done. Right? That's the, that's the, 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 the crux of Gethsemane. That's what Jesus Christ was able to say as son of man and son of God, that if possible, let this cup pass me. Let this wrath, let this judgment that I'm about to take on pass me. This is what I want. Is I want this to pass, but not my will, but yours be done. So all of us have dreams to say, to say prayers like that, isn't it? We want to be heroic in those times, like my pseudo-religious teacher. We want to be that hero. We want to be able to say these kind of words. But you don't say those kind of words. You don't say those kind of things because you're psyched and motivated to say them. Jesus was only able to say what he said in Gethsemane because he had been saying it for all his days. His obedience in a pivotal time of his life, in the pivotal time of the work of salvation, was only possible because he had been obeying for all the, the days, the weeks, and the months prior. He was already saying that. He was already doing it. He was already in that place. That's why when the time of test came, he knew what to say. He had enough within him to say it because he was already living in obedience. So obedience, what I'm trying to say here, saints, obedience is not a matter of being psyched up. It's not a matter about being motivated enough to say the right things at the right time. We don't get prepared like that. We don't get prepared for the last days, for the end times in that way. You don't try to psych up your audience to prepare themselves for what is to come. You, you, you try to bring scripture to them. You try to confront them. You try to show them areas of, areas of their life that are not in obedience with scripture, that are not in obedience to God's word. That's how obedience comes about. Obedience is not bravado. Obedience is not you shouting and screaming louder. Obedience is not you having a steel face and a stern face, being able to look at your persecutor's eyes and say, yeah, go ahead and shoot me. That's the romantic version. That's the Hollywood version. That's the version you see in movies and in TV shows and TV series. The obedience God, the, the obedience Christ expressed, the obedience that Christ showed to us in the Garden of Gethsemane and even to his journey to the cross and ultimate sacrifice was only possible because he had lived in obedience as the son of man and the son of God for all the 33 years of his life. In the times when he, no one was watching him in the time before his baptism when he was just serving as a carpenter's son, he was in obedience. He was already in obedience before we even knew who he was. <laughs> even before that, even in all, in all eternity, before the beginning of time, he was already in obedience. So we don't understand what it means, saints, to be in obedience. That obedience is not a momentary action. It is a lifestyle. It is a condition. It is a spirit that we need to inhabit. It is something the new creation brings with it into our lives. And it causes us to live as sons and daughters of obedience, where everything in our lives is brought into light, where everything in our lives is concentrated, that nothing is left un un unknown. Nothing is left unshined on. Nothing is left unturned. Everything is revealed in the presence of the Father. Everything is revealed 
when that sonship life comes to take a hold of us. That is what salvation must do. That is what salvation must accomplish in our lives. That is eternal salvation. That's why he was a priest that was so different from all the others. He was the great high priest because his sacrifice was a once and for all thing. His sacrifice would end this cycle of sin, sacrifice, sin, sacrifice. No more. Why? Because we now live in obedience to the Father. Through the life and death of the Son of God and the Son of Man, we now inherit this privilege, this honor of living this life. But our obedience must come from this place. Our obedience must be total, must be subjected, must be yielded to Him, not in spurts, not in areas. You cannot have a life where you obey God in certain areas, but you disobey God in certain areas. You cannot have life obeying God only in church or only when with your family, but you're not obeying God when you're in college. You're not obeying God when you're overseas studying or when you're overseas doing a project or when, with your, or when, you're, when you are with your colleagues and your friends going out for a movie. That's not how it works. Obedience is in everything. And if it's not in one thing, that is, in, that is not in everything. Simple as that. That is what obedience means to the writer in Hebrews. And that was what he was trying to communicate to the people that he was writing to. That this is where you are falling short. You have all the knowledge in your mind. You have all the fascination of who Christ is. But you have not lived in obedience. So what he's saying is this Christ you serve. This is how he obeyed. This is what obedience meant for him. And this is what he means for you. This is what you must come into. This is the life that you now have to live. This is what it means. This is, this is the price that you have to pay. Now, with this established, I want this now to be a lens that we put on our eyes. And I want you guys, I want us to now look at a set, another passage in the Bible. I'm going to close with this in Luke chapter 15. All right. So it's the parable of... Um, famous parable of the prodigal son. So bear again in mind what we have been discussing for the past half an hour and 40 minutes. And I want to close with this. So breaking in verse 11. Okay. So again, we, we've read this before time and time again, but take note now of what, of what we know of obedience, of what the Hebrew writer revealed to us of the obedience that Christ lived and look at it through this lens. Hopefully it will mean something to you as it did to me. So breaking in verse 11, uh, again, sorry, before I go into that, forgot. Um, the context here, if you realize, uh, there are a few parables that Jesus talks about here, starting in verse 15, right? There's the parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin and the lost son. And then the next preceding um, parable is the parable of the unjust servant. Now this this line of parables that Jesus begins is actually in response to, um, to the Pharisees, in fact, All right? So when Jesus is actually mentioning uh, these parables, he was saying to these Pharisees that this is who you are, that I'm not, in a way, what he's, I'm paraphrasing here, he's not saying that this is your condition, A, B, C, D, this is what is happening to you. He's using the parables and indirectly telling them this is your problem, okay? So, Parable of the lost son. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his, his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to, impro he began to be impoverished. Excuse me. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly fill his stomach with the pots that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread that I'm dying here with hunger? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will go up to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven 
And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us celebrate and let's eat and celebrate. For a son of mine was dead, has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now, I actually like to believe, I'm pausing here for a bit. I actually like to believe that this part that now continues on in verse 25 onwards, Jesus is actually referring, a lot of scholars believe, that the older son is referring to the Pharisees he's talking to. So this was actually what Jesus was trying to say. Okay, So a lot of us, we like this parable because of the story of the the son who has fallen away because of loose leaving and is restored, right? It's a wonderful imagery, a wonderful story of redemption. And that's wonderful. But this is the second part that we don't often talk about or that we don't often see. But this is the part that actually Jesus wants to bring home, the point home, okay? So he says, now his older son was in the field. And again, realize that the, 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 the reality of sonship is very central to this parable, two sons, okay? Now, the older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And see, this is his reaction. Upon hearing the return of his brother, he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. Some of you have your translations. I have never disobeyed you. You have that, right? I have never disobeyed any of your commandments. Sound familiar, guys? See the spirit of this, of this, of this older son. I have never disobeyed you. He is telling the father what my obedience means. I have never disobeyed the commandment of yours. And yet, you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, see the way he talks, right? You who was who had devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf from him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me. I like that. 31. Son, you have always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and begun to live, and was lost and now has been found. So you see, saints, it's very interesting that the oldest son, who is actually the Pharisees in this case, what Jesus, Jesus is saying that this is who you are. This is what you guys are. You look at the sinful. You look at the prostitutes. You look at these men and women who are sinful, right? And you judge them. You judge them. You compare yourself to them. You are like this older brother who think that you know it all, who thinks that you have been so good, so blessed, so right, so obedient, that you get to decide who is right and who is wrong. You will not even confer, you will not even yield and say to the Father that you have the right to be happy. I rejoice with you because my brother has returned. I can rejoice with you because your son has returned. He couldn't, why? Because he was blind to his own condition. Was his brother wrong? Yes. But he was equally in the wrong. That's why he took the father to say to him, son, you have always been with me. So what Jesus is saying, is that not enough that I've been, that you're always with me, that you are my son? Is that not enough? Again, coming back to this, I, to this whole reality of sonship reality, of sonship obedience. So when he says, I have never been disobedient, that's actually ironic because in this instance, he is disobeying. <laughs> He's not disobeying in terms of, you know, explicit acts. He's not doing what his younger brother is doing, but his spirit is in disobedience. He's not rejoicing. He's not with the father. He's not, he doesn't recognize the father's joy in what is happening. He's angry with the brother. Now he's angry with the father. Can you imagine that? Now, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of society, does he have a point? Does he have a case? Yes. I work so hard. I never disobeyed any of your commandments. And yet here comes my younger brother who squandered half your wealth, by the way, and he gets a fatted calf. You put a robe around him. How is this fair? Saints, that is obedience. That is obedience to know that it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what is right for me. It's about what the father wants. 
The older brother was not cognizant. He was not aware. He was not understanding of what the father was going through. He did not understand what it meant to the father. Why? Because he was not with the father. So when the father said, son, you are always with me, what was he trying to say? You don't know. You are not with me. So the problem is not with the younger son. At least the younger son had that understanding, that, that dawning that, you know what, I'm not worthy to be a son. And he came back to the father. But this older son who knows it all, who has it all, who is obedient, I've never disobeyed. Unlikely, actually, because you are in a disobedience. You don't know the father's heart. If you had obeyed, you would have rejoiced. If you had obeyed, you would know the father's heart. You would know that this is what it means to the father, that you, that you can rejoice as much as with the father because your brother has returned. So this is actually a condemnation. We don't know it, but Jesus is actually condemning the Pharisees that you are living in disobedience. While obeying, you are in disobedience. You are like this older son. I have never disobeyed. I have done all that you have commanded. I have, I have been faithful to the scripture. I have followed all of the law strictly. And this is what you do? God, this is unfair. Father, this is unfair. Can you imagine the God? Can you imagine the... <clears throat> the blatant disregard of, of the father's heart in the oldest son. And don't think for a minute that this is only because, oh, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking about us, saints, that we can be so far from the father's heart. We can be so foreign from who the father is that we don't even know that these things we are saying cuts the father's heart. That the father has to say to us, you have always been with me. Son, you have always been with me. So why didn't, why didn't the oldest son know that you have always been with me? Why didn't the, the son know that this is how the father's heart is? It's because he wasn't living in obedience. He was living with his definition of what it means to obey. For him, obedience was, again, what, what I'm good at. I follow this. I follow that. I do this. I do that. And if I do all of these things, God must be pleased with me. Sound familiar? God must be happy with me. I'll bring it down to our level. Okay? I'm good in church. I serve. I do all of that which is required of me. I get involved in ministry. I do youth services. I do youth programs. I song lead in church every now and again. You know, I'm one of the most productive members of our church. I obey. But yet outside, you know, I'm living my life recklessly. Outside, I'm flirting around. I'm drinking myself silly. I'm doing all of this other thing. Just as an example to you, where's the obedience there? Where is the obedience when you're out there, when no one is watching, when you're outside of church? Where is it there? So this elder son, saints, it's all of us. It's you and me, where we pick and choose our obedience. We pick and choose the places we want to be judged. So what the elder son was trying to say to the father is, in comparison to my brother, I'm much better. In comparison to my brother, I have done everything in accordance to what you desire. I've not gone out there to squander. I've not gone out there to live like prostitutes. I've not gone out there with, and do drugs and do all of these things. I'm better. No, you're not. In the father's estimation, they were both his sons and he loved them both. But only one son knew what it meant to be in the father's heart. Only one son knew what it meant to come back to the father in repentance. And that was the son who sinned, not the son who was getting it right. So obedience, saints, it's not a matter of what we are good at and what we are not good at. Obedience is everything. It's in everything that we are. It's a relational reality. That, old, that younger son understood it. When he was eating all the, the, with the pigs in the pigsty, he understood it. That this is what I want. I want to return back to the father's house. And he was willing to lose his sonship. He even said, don't even call me a son. And yet the father embraced him so thoroughly. Because that's who God is, saints. So to, if you ask me, the oldest son is in a worse state than the younger son. And the, and the oldest son didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't what he did wrong that was the point. It was what he was. His state of being was in the wrong place. His heart was in the wrong place. There were things in him that was not in obedience. And by him, I mean, I mean, of course, this is a fictional character in the parable that Jesus is talking about. But he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to you and me. This is who we are, saints. This is who the church will be even in the last days when Israel, faces the, the, when Israel faces her own persecution. Where will the church be? What will be the church's attitude when Israel is restored? 
through that time of self, to that time of great, great judgment and ultimate restoration? Where will we stand? What will our attitude be? What will our spirit be? Will it be in, of obedience, true obedience, or will it be something like what this older brother is revealing? So that's my word to all of us today. He possessed, the older son possessed no clarity of his own condition. He could only see what was wrong with his brother. He could see what the brother did wrong and, and why the, the brother was wrong, why the father was wrong. But yet, he could not see his own self. He could not see his own blindness, his own darkness. Now, let me close with this and go back to Hebrews chapter 5. And it's interesting, if you were to look at this, in the last few verses, starting from verse 11, as the Hebrew writer uh, speaks of a priest that is forever, all right, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he kind of switches his, uh, his, 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 um, his focus, right? He talks about Christ, talks about what obedience is, how obedience is accomplished. And then he turns and says, concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So now he's talking directly to his audience, okay? He's established what, uh, what, what, who Christ is and what obedience he demands. Now he's saying, look at you all, okay? Look at, look at, this, look at the audience. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of, or of the oracles of God, okay? So, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, and because of the practice, and because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So, like that older brother, saints, one of the things you want, you realize with obedience is this: that if you are not in a place of true obedience, you do not mature. You become stagnant. You don't grow. You don't realize things about yourself. You don't see things about your own situation, about your own condition. The younger brother saw it, but the older brother did not. And who was living in obedience? You would say the older brother, right? So similarly, we are like that. That if we don't give ourselves to obedience, darkness comes upon us. Immaturity seeps in. We will never grow. And when you don't grow, you don't see yourself in the way you should be seen. You don't mature. You don't understand. You only are used to milk. You don't want strong meat. You don't want meat that actually can give you the nutrients, that can give you the proteins to build up your muscles, to build you up to be a strong Christian. So the attainment of spiritual maturity does not come with knowledge. Again, what is he referring to? He's referring to these believers. You don't attain the spiritual maturity to knowing more of scripture. You know so much. You know even about the person of Christ, but yet you will not obey. You will not give in. You will not surrender. And because of that, you are immature. You may be big on the outside. Your body may be huge, but your spirit is so small. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. That whenever we are living in disobedience, lo and behold, look at it. Immaturity will seep in. This obedience leads to maturity. Obedience means the Lord will show things to you. When you are in a place of true obedience, re revelation will come as to who you are, as to the things in your lives that are still short of his glory. He will make you see things you won't be comfortable with. He will make you see things you don't like. And those of you who have been in, in this ministry will know what I'm talking about. That things have been revealed. We have, expo we have confronted you. I have been confronted. My brother, my sister-in-law, uh, my mother, my father, we have all been confronted with one another in our conditions and our issues of life. And that only comes because of obedience, saints. It's not an easy road, it's what, but it is one we all have to go into because that is the price of maturity. That is how we take strong meat. So knowing more of scripture, knowing more theology, knowing more doctrine, it's good but it's not what leads you to maturity. You may be matured in thinking, you may be matured in the way you interpret text, but you will not be matured on the inside. You will not be matured spiritually speaking. Why? Because of what? Hebrews 5 verse 11. Simple as that. Obedience leads to spiritual maturity. Also, Chambers says that to grow in a spiritual sense is not to know more scripture, it's to obey. The more you obey, the more you grow. The more you disobey, the more you regress. The more, the, more, the more ignorant you become of your own condition, 
like that older brother, like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, like the scribes, who were not willing to obey the Father's heart, who was foreign to who the Father truly is. They knew all of Scripture. They knew all of the doctrines. They knew the Pentateuch. They knew the history of Israel. They knew everything back and front, but they never knew the Father's heart. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? <clears throat> you search the Scriptures, and yet you will not, in that you think you will find life, and yet you will not come to me. There we go. Because true knowledge doesn't come from the study of Scripture. True knowledge comes from obedience. So may that be the prayer of every saint who knows the Lord. So Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this word that you have given to us. Thank you, Lord, that, that this is the obedience that you demand from every one of us, that you would have us all, Lord, to, to cry out to you that, Lord, we are truly unworthy to be called your sons, unworthy because we are sinful beings. We are creatures of darkness. We love darkness. And we run away from the light, and that is the condemnation. So come, Lord, convict us of the things in our lives that are short of your glory. Convict us of the things that are lingering in our hearts that are still not in obedience to you, that have not surrendered to you. May it now come, Lord, to, to be so real, to be so stuck in our lives that, Lord, we cannot live with this inconsistency, that we may be doing things correctly on the outside. We may be involved in this and that and the other. Men and women may be praising us, commending us and patting us on the shoulder and our backs, saying that we are good Christians. But Lord, if, if you say otherwise, if there are things you are revealing in our hearts, Lord, that are still not in obedience, then Lord, you reveal things to us. You show us, Father, the areas of darkness in our lives and what we have to do to correct those things, to live, Father, in obedience, to live now in surrender to you. So come, Lord, convict us with your word beyond even this Sabbath, beyond even this Sunday. Lord, cause there, cause there to be such a conviction that will arise in the hearts of many men and women uh, that will hear your words, that will hear what is it that you are saying. Not just read scripture as, as a form of study, but to read it as a form of you speaking into their hearts and speaking into their lives. Be it here in Malaysia or even in, 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 in Indonesia, in Thailand, Lord, in, in Sri Lanka, in Africa, in Uganda. Lord, in Sweden, let, this be, let, let that be such an awakening. Let that be such a, a, a realization and awareness of what it means to live in a spirit of obedience. Lord, unless and until we have that, Father, we will never grow. We will never mature. We will never see ourselves in the way that you do. Father, that is, that is, that is the, the, the ultimate, Lord, to know you, to see you, and to live in that place with you. And in that process, to know even ourselves to know, Father, what it is that needs to be corrected. So we come before you this day, thanking you for this new life, thanking you for this spirit of obedience. Thank you that, Lord Jesus, you learned this. You took this on. You learned it through the things in which you suffered, and you now want us to be a part of that obedience. So, Jesus, we are grateful to you for the word that you did, for the word that you did, for the sacrifice that you gave yourself to. Come, Lord, give it to us, grant it to us. Show us, Father, the things of our lives, the things of our hearts, the things in our behaviors and our thoughts and our actions that are not consistent with your will and your way. Father, bring it, bring it to, to, to light. And in that light, Father, let us confront and do business with you on our knees and make it right with you, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of your people, Israel, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your life in us. So, Lord, we thank you. We come before you this day. We humbly ask you to come and speak to us and to confirm your word in our lives. We ask this and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay. Mepin, can you take the uh, cup and the bread and, and dispense it? At this point, we will be now taking the communion. So, saints in Singapore, please do join us. Thank you. And I would like to have Joshua to pray for the cup, um, pray for the bread, excuse me, and Trikam to pray for the cup. So, um, Joshua, you can come up here and then take the mic from me, all right? And after that, when you're done, uh, Trikam will take over. We'll just give some time for me to pass the emblems. Thank you, Father.
Joshua? Thank you a lot for the word today. Thank you for how real it is for every one of us as well. Lord, that we relate to who the author of Hebrews is writing to. Even though on the outside we can be so we can be such a model Christian, especially on Sundays, oh God, but Lord, in the rest of our lives on the, on the outside, when we are alone or with people or with, uh, with, with anyone else, oh God, we can, we can just be so disobedient in our hearts. Lord, as Paul says, we are indeed children of disobedience. As the writer of the Hebrews say, oh God, we can be, we can, it's so hard for us to hear already your your what what the spirit of disobedience or oh, spirit of obedience is saying to us. So we thank you for we thank you, Lord Jesus, for showing to us, for living that life of obedience to the Father of God. Indeed, his obedience, your obedience is not just to die on the cross for us, Lord, but that itself is the sum of your obedience for his entire life on earth, from the moment he was born to um, grow, growing up and, and being persecuted by the Jews, his own people, Lord, every moment he was obedient to you. And because of that, oh God, we, have, we, we can receive this spirit of obedience. So Lord, let us receive this spirit of obedience, Lord. Let our hearts not reject it. Let our pride not reject it, Lord, that we will not be blind like the older brother. And, to, and, and even, Lord, to see that even in our obedience, we can be disobedient. Even in the areas we want, we choose to obey you, O oh God, we can still be disobedient because there are still areas of our life we do not want to confront. There are still areas of our life we still want to hide, O oh God. So please, Lord, forgive us for our sins, O oh God, and give us that strength, give us that spirit of obedience uh, that we can choose to respond to you, Lord. We do not know how. I do not know how I will re respond to you tomorrow or in the end times especially, Lord, but we know, Lord, that our decision then or our decision tomorrow, it is, uh, it is built upon our obedience today, or built upon our decisions today, oh God, every moment of our life. So we give thanks to you. We pray for, uh, yeah, may you bless this time of communion uh, for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, once again for your word. Thank you for this bread and cup that we can hold it in our hands and we can partake. It's only because you have first obeyed, Lord, that you have first obeyed the Father and you know the Father's heart from the very beginning. Lord, that you have, you have pierced into the very core of our being today, O oh God, and the very center of obedience, O oh God, is... It's a spirit, oh God. It's, it's not what we do. It's, it's, it's not even how we behave, Lord. It's, it's not all the outward things, Lord, but it's the inward parts that you are looking at. It's the heart, oh God, that you are looking at. And you're asking us and posing the question to us today, Father, whether we know you. Do we really know you? Do we really know the Father's heart? Do we really share the Father's burden? Are we really this, do we really carry the spirit of Jesus, the Son, Lord, whose entire focus, whose entire desire is just to please the Father's heart, oh God, even to the point of the, at the cross. Lord, to be able to say that not my will be done, but yours be done, oh God. Lord, we ask in humility and in brokenness. Grant us such a spirit, oh God.
purify our hearts. Lord, for we do not know ourselves until you shine your light. For we do not know what is in our hearts. For we do not know how much we have not obeyed you until you show us, oh God, what manner of spirit we carry within us. Until you show us your son, until you lift your son high above and show us that model, Lord, and, 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 and that's how we see, oh God, how far we have fallen short, how far we are. We are not like your son, Lord. So we pray, oh God, these days that indeed give us the grace, Lord, give us that humility, give us that heart of obedience, oh God, even as you are sharing your heart with us once again, oh God, we embrace you, we embrace your words, we embrace all that you have spoken to us, oh God, and, and bring us to that place, Lord, that we will obey you from the heart, that we obey you from the spirit. We obey you in our very disposition in everything that we do. Lord, it's only when our disposition is right, it's only when our heart is being made right, Lord, all the outward things will fall into the right place. So God, it's not how much we work and we strive and we, we, we force ourselves to do things right, to do this right, to do that right, Lord. But when the inside is right, all things will become right. So, Lord, we pray that you do such a work in our hearts like no man can do, but you can do it, oh God. So shine your light. Shine your light today, even as you are shining, Lord, we say yes to you. And we pray for all that will be hearing these words, Lord, that you pierce into the very core of your being. You pierce into the very heart, Lord, that we will know you for who you are. That we will know and we will be able to come and join into the spirit of Jesus. Lord, even as we partake the communion, Lord, we unite, you unite us together as your body, oh God. Give us that same spirit, oh God, that even as we drink from this cup and eat of this bread, that we'll partake of this same spirit of Christ. This is what unite us together. Lord, regardless of our race, regardless of our culture, of our background, oh God, it is, it is this spirit of Christ that will unite us together. We thank you, O oh God, for your broken body and, and your blood that is being poured up to us in obedience, Lord. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now partake of the bread and the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Praise you. Can I have... <clears throat> Can I have Stephen to close us in prayer? My God, we thank you for this morning message. Lord, may, may your word, oh God, continue to, to speak so loudly into our spirit, man, mm -hmm. that your word which calls us, call us onto obedience, O oh Lord, ring loud and clear and resonate in our spirit all the days of our lives, even right from right now, Lord God, Lord, today, that Lord, every moment that we spend with our family members um, and wherever we, our, our people may take us onto, you know, um, engaging in, in uh, mundane things, that, Lord, at the back of, of, of our minds, that, Lord, we will carry this message of yours, this call of yours, that we are to be obedient unto you in all things, O oh God. And so through this obedience that we may truly come to know you as, as you really are. We thank you, O oh God, Lord, for, for the revelation that came to the younger son, to the younger son that, which caused him to cry out in repentance and saying that I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against the father. Yep. Yes, oh God, Lord, so help us also to come into that place to, as your Holy Spirit examine us into those areas of our lives that have yet to be fully surrendered unto you, mm -hmm. that have not been called unto obedience, Lord that, Lord, we will come into this place of true repentance, that, Lord, 
you know, it's not obedience is not about obeying a set of rules and obeying a set of laws, mm. but it's obeying obeying unto a person, mm. obeying unto you. Truly, it is a spirit of obedience. Mm. Hallelujah. Father, we thank yeah. you. We thank you for speaking to us, Lord, this morning. You are good to us. Mm. Indeed, oh God, Lord, this salvation that has come to us is a great salvation, yeah. a great, great salvation. And may we really, you know, come into this knowledge and understanding of how great this salvation is because of how mm. great a God you are. Yeah. We praise you and we thank you. Yeah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Stephen. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, we can now, I think, adjourn to lunch, maybe? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so please adjourn back to the hall and uh, continue to our fellowship with everyone.